Hi, welcome to The Architect. I'm Jim Powell with our special guest, John Sherholtz, the Hall of Famer. As we go back through the National League Championship Series victories for the Braves in the 90s. We already have talked about 1991, what a remarkable year that was. And now you have to go into 1992. And since we had no idea what this team was going to do in 91, and then it went out and boggled our minds, what did you think you knew about the, the team going into 1992? Did you have worries? Well, we knew, we found out from that series a year prior, they were warriors. They were not going to give up. They were not going to give in. The leadership that we had in uniform on the field continued to show their, themselves uh, to stabilize those young guys, to get them to relax and play their game. And it happened not only on the offensive side of the ball, but the pitching side of the ball and the defense. We had a, we had a, a great played series in the year prior. And going into this one, we had to be equally as good and prepared to play this tough team again, which is never easy to do. I know that Bobby Cox, in my mind, greatest manager of all time. I don't know if you agree or disagree. I'm pretty sure I know the answer, though. Um, I think you're right up there at the top of the list as well. In fact, I, I've told you before, I think the combination of John Sherholtz and Bobby Cox, general manager and manager, I, I'd be hard pressed to go through the history of baseball and find a duo that worked better together and had better results. All that said, I'm going to ask you to look back on Bobby's uh, performance in 1991, where he had these, this mixture of the veterans and the kids, and the, nobody knew what this team could do, wasn't sure how. When you watched him maneuver through 91, was that maybe his best job ever as a manager? Uh, it was one of his best jobs. He had so many, it would be hard for me to qualify one as the most, most uh, excellent job he has ever done because he's done he did it every year uh, he's a great baseball mind he's a great leader he has a unique capability of, of creating uh, relationships with people that are appropriate but he gets their confidence and people are comfortable around Bobby playing the game working for him working with him as I did it's such a comfortable circumstance because he is the man that he is and the human being that he is and when you have the opportunity, as you know, as you have had, to, to interview Bobby or to work side by side with Bobby, and we had to make some big decisions. And sometimes we didn't always agree, but we found a way to make the decision that was the best for the team, and we did that. That's the kind of guy Bobby was, but when he got in that dugout, you put all that aside. He was as big a competitor as anybody that ever stood in a Major League Baseball dugout. Well, as you alluded to it a moment ago, it's a rematch now in the National League Ch Championship Series in 1992, and what a great opportunity. You know the Pirates are just salivating. They get a shot at the Braves. I'm sure it never stopped hurting, losing, having a, a great ch chance to win the 91 in LCS, and then seeing the Braves steal it away, and here they are. They're back at you again. What did you think of the matchup going in? Well, I, I, I was uh, relieved that we were able to get back into that next series play. And, and um, you know, not com well, comfortable, completely comfortable that we were playing the Pirates again. Because if we play each other the year before, they sort of get a ten the, the tendencies of our player and the and managers and ideas and schemes and all that. But we were back in it, and that was the most important thing. And our young players and our veteran players, again, coalesced and just went out and played the games that needed to be played in the fashion they had to be played for us to get another win. Well, before we flash all the way to Game 7, where we'll concentrate, Game one of the 92 National League Championship Series, John Smoltz just too much. Beat Drabeck 5-1 to one in Atlanta. Braves had home field this time. Game two, it's the Braves routing the Pirates 13-5. to five. Steve Avery gets the win over Danny Jackson. You're up 2 nothing. You had a route. You had big crowds. Got to be a great feeling going to Pittsburgh for game three, doesn't it? Well, it was. I mean, again, when you have that kind of a performance and you, you uplift the team and you're in your uh, positive spirits are about you and you get on the plane and you get ready to go play in, in the other person's ballpark, you feel better about that. And that's what our guys did time and time and time again during these playoff championship series. And that's when Wakefield happened. Yeah, Wakefield. Um, next to Hoyt Wilhelm, who I happened to see pitch when I was a young man in Baltimore, uh, he was the best knuckleball pitcher that I ever laid eyes on. And he demonstrated that against our team several times. We, we barely could make contact with his knuckleball. And he really, he really set us back. Um, so it's a good thing he couldn't pitch every game. <laughs> well, he almost could. He almost could. But uh, not quite. Uh, so Wakefield beats Glavin. Pirates take uh, game three, three to two. Game four, the Braves come back behind Smoltz, find a way to beat Drabeck, never easy, win it six to four. Game five, it's the Pirates at home, beating up Steve Avery and the Braves, seven to one the final score. 
and then you head back home and the Braves are in a lot of trouble. Pirates have been able to get back into this series and you know they're thinking, we're gonna knock these guys right out. We're about to even the score with them. You know, can you, can you imagine how the Pirates were thinking after what had happened the year prior, the devastation that they had to suffer through and then the year that they built back and they got a chance to play us again. Uh, but we didn't, we didn't feel any differently than we always felt. We felt like we had a good team, we had a manager in control, we had a leader that was gonna take us in the, in the manner that we had to play the games to win and we were able to do that. Well, in game six, Tim Wakefield does it again to the Braves for the second time. Braves lose 13 to four, setting up the game seven where the Braves are gonna be hosting and they'll have to try and find a way to beat Doug Drabeck and he was on his game in game seven. Welcome back to sold out Atlanta Fulton County Stadium for game seven of the National League Championship Series. As the Pittsburgh Pirates try to become just the eighth team in Major League history to come from three games to one down and win a postseason series. And by forcing a game seven, they have another chance for Doug Drabeck as he goes head to head with John Smoltz for the third time in the series. John Smoltz has already beaten Drabeck twice in this series. And if he wins again tonight versus Drabeck, it will be the first time in postseason history that one pitcher will have beaten the same mound opponent in the same series three times. I think this is going to be a well-pitched ball game. Graybeck was their horse. He was their number one pitcher. He was their John Smoltz. He was the big power arm guy, uh, a finesse, not finesse pitcher, but a really a dynamic pitcher. Knew what to do, knew how to carve up hitters, and could do it almost at will, as Smoltz could and, and a number of our other pitchers could as well. But it was a great matchup for that game. Well, Smoltzy didn't give up much either, and, and uh, they scratched out a couple of runs and had a 2-0 lead going into the bottom half of the ninth inning, and I'm sure the Pirates think they've got this. They, they, they've got this. They've got Drabeck still out there on the mound dealing. They've got the lead. All they need is a, a, a three more outs, and they're off to the World Series, and they've even the score with the Braves, but the Braves had other plans, didn't they? Just three more outs, and we realize how difficult that is in these circumstances where champion, championships are on the line. Getting those last th three more outs is very, very difficult at times. Well, the Braves are able to get Drabeck out of the game in the ninth inning. Terry Pendleton led it off with a double to right field. David Justice reached on an error, a rare error by Lean, the second baseman, and that put two on with nobody out. Terry Pendleton at third base. Bream walks to load the bases, so the Pirates say, all right, that's enough of Drabeck. They bring in Stan Belinda. Now, Braves are still trailing by a couple of runs here, what were you thinking when they changed pitchers? Were you glad to see Drabeck get out of the game? Yes, I was because he was their stud and he had the makeup of a, of a winner. And, and I'm not saying that Belinda didn't, but Stan Belinda's style, repertoire, was fastballs high, sliders away to right-handed hitters. And he seldom threw pitches that were sinking to get a ground ball. And in the circumstance we were in then, where the base runners were located, he needed to get a ground ball to try to get a double play turn and end the game and get back on the plane to go to Pittsburgh. Ron Gant comes up next against Belinda, and you and I were talking about this. I asked you how hard did he hit that ball? It was a, a line, out, line out sack fly down the left field line to get the Braves on the board. Right. I, I thought that was out when he hit it. I thought you know the balls carry in our ballpark as they have always, and I thought it was out when he hit it. And I was feeling pretty good about that, but it was a sacrifice fly. It got us on the board, and we were back in the game. Then Damon Berryhill pinch hits. He walks to load the bases. Brian Hunter comes up as a pinch hitter for Belliard. He pops out. So now the Braves are down to their final out, and they're down to their final hope, and that's Francisco Cabrera. And now the Braves' season hangs in the balance as Francisco Cabrera comes to the plate to bat for the pitcher. Frankie had been a hero from time to time throughout the season for us. He's a wonderful guy, well loved by his teammates, um, with confidence in him by the manager. And Bobby knew that when he was sending Frankie up there in that particular circumstance where all the marbles were on the line, that he believed, Bobby believed, that Frankie was gonna be able to come through and do something. The first ball he hit off of Lynn, maybe the second pitch, he just roped a line drive foul, just foul, past the left field foul pole. The 2-0 pitch, well hit, but hooking foul and left. He had the green light on 2-0 and, oh and hammered it, but well fouled over the Pirate bullpen. And hit it very, very hard. And then the next one, of course, he, he hit, managed to hit it into left center field. Pittsburgh 2, Atlanta 1, with two outs in the bottom of the ninth inning. 
in game seven of the National League Championship Series. A lot of room in right center. If he hits one there, we can dance in the streets. The 2 1. Swung line drive left field. One run is in. Here comes Green. Here's the throw to the plate. He is safe. Braves win. Braves win. Braves win. Braves win. Braves win. And we scored the run because we had one of the fastest runners in all of baseball, Sid Bream, at second base to score that run. Skip Carey did a great job calling that. Were you calling it yourself in your own box? Oh, calling it and jumping and, and screaming and elating and all of that. It was just wonderful. And then, especially with Sid, with the brace on his knee. I mean, that was almost like Marquis de Sade said, OK, we're going to put Sid at second base and see if he can score on a base hit. And he did. He did score. Now, in this era, and you've been a big part of the development of replay in Major League Baseball, Skip's call would have been something more like, He's ruled safe, but hold on. Everybody stop, because this is going to be reviewed. It's very close, and almost certainly would have been reviewed. Wouldn't you agree? Well, let me say this. As chairman of the Instant Replay Committee at, uh, at, at Bud Sheely, Commissioner Sheely's uh, behest, I, I did that for three years. Uh, and I'm glad we have Instant Replay now. I think it takes the, all the questions about play calling. But at that time, in my Instant Replay, from my eyes, Sid Bream was safe by just about that much. <laughs> and the home plate umpire was completely accurate. John McSherry made an immediate call, vehement call. Um, it was one of the great plays in the history of baseball. I do think, since I'm a broadcaster, I, I do think about it sometimes from uh, what it would have sounded like, where it would have basically ruined Skip Carey's call, which is maybe the most iconic call in the history of the Braves. Some delicious irony there. Yeah, it was. And, and it was an exciting call. and. We all will dribble in about that. John Smoltz was awesome. He was on the mound to start in a clinch game for each National League Championship Series in 91 and 92. First pitcher in history to start game seven of LCSs in consecutive seasons. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And that's not, that's not a coincidence, is it? I'm, not not a not like you lightly decide who's going to pitch the clincher. No, no, it's not a coincidence. You put that guy out that, on the mound, he's a horse, he's a stud, he's a competitor, he's an athlete, and he's going to get he's going to get it done. And the Pirates, that was basically the end of the Pirates. It's like you stepped on their neck right there. Their team was about to break up. They knew that. They had to win that game to have to get the glory that that talent of the team deserved, and you denied them. We did, and our, and our team deserves all the credit, and Bobby's leadership and the coaches all did a wonderful job to have our guys ready. Pennant number two in the 90s, but we're far from complete here as we go through the architect with John Scherholtz. I'm Jim Powell. Thanks for watching. Back with the 95 NLCS next in our next episode. Thank you.